Elvis Mitchell grew up in Detroit in the 1970s, when new voices were emerging in cinema. He captures that era in the Netflix documentary, Is That Black Enough For You? I'm Tom Powers, and this is Pure Nonfiction. If you're a regular listener, maybe you've heard me mention Detroit. I was born in the city, raised in its suburbs, and gained my love for film at the Detroit Institute of Arts, where its film series is still curated by Elliot Wilhelm. When I moved to New York in the 1990s to break into documentary, I paid close attention to the byline of Elvis Mitchell, because I knew he was from Detroit. I followed him as a critic at the LA Weekly, the Detroit Free Press, and his four-year stint at the New York Times. He has a long-standing podcast from KCRW called The Treatment, where he's interviewed a who's who of the film world. Now he's directed his first documentary called Is That Black Enough For You? It's a rich history of black American cinema from 1968 to 1978. Often that era is reduced to the black exploitation genre of hits like Shaft and Superfly. Elvis brings a fresh perspective to those films, but he also gives us a wider understanding of how many more figures broke through in those years, including pioneers such as William Greaves, Gordon Parks, and Charles Burnett. Elvis narrates the film and interviews icons such as Harry Belafonte and Lawrence Fishburne. Throughout, Elvis describes his own movie going in the 1970s and his first encounters with films such as The Spook Who Sat by the Door, The Learning Tree, and Cotton Comes to Harlem. Elvis describes the significance for black audiences to finally see themselves in lead roles. Up until then, Hollywood's representation of African Americans was either non-existent or dominated by racist caricatures. Elvis narrates over a sequence of vintage cartoon clips with images straight out of minstrel shows. These were probably some of the scenes that made their way into my grandmother's subconscious, fragments that she had to fight from overtaking her image of herself along with the way she was treated as a young woman of color in Mississippi. Her awareness of images was such that when we visited her in Hattiesburg, she wouldn't let us watch reruns of The Andy Griffith Show. She would say, there's no black people in that southern town. What do you think happened to them? All this can sure make it hard for me to love the movies. For me, it's been a lifetime of watching and thinking and writing about movies. I keep coming back despite the waves of disregard they keep hitting me with. The diminution can feel like a mountain. I sat down with Elvis in April in front of a live audience at the Free Film Festival put on by the Detroit Free Press. Our conversation continually circles back to the city. Elvis went to college at Wayne State University and had early experiences programming films at theaters near the campus. In his early 20s, he had a chance meeting with Pauline Kael when she was visiting Detroit that gave him momentum to move to Los Angeles and become a film critic. I've been crossing paths with Elvis for over 20 years, and I studied up on him more to prepare for this, but there was a glaring detail I still didn't know. That's where our conversation begins. One thing that I never have seen covered, it must be somewhere, but I didn't get to it. Where'd you get the name Elvis? I was born in 1960. It's as simple as that. My mother's an Elvis Presley fan. I wish I had a better story, I swear to you. Um, but I can tell you, like, one of the happiest days of my life was August 12, 1977. Like, oh, shoot, because people stopped making the jokes. And that was also the year of Elvis Costello. So it's like in the space of like three months, that name and, the, and its connotations changed in the world. Elvis Costello understood that, giving himself that name. Uh, you were able to go out and kind of be the, uh, you know, to, to wear that name uh, strongly. It was always an eye-catching byline, so I think it's probably served you well. It was always kind of weird. I kind of felt like, you know, when you hear stories about Barack Obama being a kid and calling himself Barry, because <laughs> um, that was a big, odd name to have. And I went by my middle name, which is Lewis, and named after my dad for a while. And at my immediate family, I'm still called that. So I feel like they're two different people. Like Elvis Mitchell is this guy who I've always wanted to meet. And, but then maybe he's not as much fun as I think he's going to be, so I stay away from him. <laughs> but people from uh, back in the neighborhood would call you a different name. 
Uh, a lot of different names, probably. But yes, um, but they would call me uh, my, my family name, and Elvis was the name I used in school. And just as I started to go further in school, and once I got to college, I didn't really have any friends that followed me from any place else. It was, I think it's when it really sort of formed around me, that name. Mm -hmm. Uh, in this new film, uh, Is That Black Enough For You, near the beginning of the film and near the end of the film, you quote your grandmother. You talk about, uh, you, you invoke her uh, and you know, lessons that she taught you that, that stuck with you. I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about you know, that figure in your life. What was really great about her is that I realized in, in retrospect what she taught me was the the point of doing what we do, which is critical thinking, which is to ask that question about what is not there and why is it not there? And, and the, the kinds of things that she would say were always along those lines. And, and I just remember like that lesson about the Andy Griffith show that I'm thinking, I'm like six, why are you bringing this up? But you know, being in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, not far from uh, the Faulkner house, uh, we walked past and she would point out, because I think she maybe run into him or something, because he was like around. Um, she would just say, we've got to ask these things. And also, it's interesting, too, because I thought about this when John Lewis passed, that if you were a certain generation of black person, you kind of rejected the movies, not because they were infantile or juvenile, but because the way you were treated when you had the experience. And she told me, because she was old enough, she was a teenager when she saw Dracula, and it literally changed the way she trained. And I thought, what an interesting thing to be aware of what your dreams were like before and after seeing a movie. But I also thought about John Lewis saying that he didn't go to movies because of the way he was treated. And my editor, Doyle, found that great clip of Dr. King talking about movies coming second and third run a year later and playing the black theaters. And there's a section of the film that we cut out that I think for my grandmother kind of illustrated a relationship to this. She'd gone to see a movie in some converted grain silo or, or grain storage place that just had like folding chairs from a church during the week in it, and a bat got loose in the theater. And she thought, I can have a bat get loose and still go pick eggs in the hen house. I'm not gonna pay money to be bitten by a bat. And she never went again. And, but there is a, a generation of people of color who have this, and still, this relationship to what movies are and what they represent. And, and there's a portion of the movie where Sam Jackson talks about, well, I would love to have had a black cowboy. And there were black cowboys, but, uh, I want that line to be in there because my grandmother also had a working farm and I saw the hands on horses. And one of the things I remember too is one of the hands explained to me what cowboy meant. And basically he was saying that the white ranch workers were called cow hands. The black workers were called cowboys. It wasn't an object of uh, affection to be called a cowboy. And it amused him to know and to see that there were cowboy movies because I think he was saying he went expecting to see black people in them, but there weren't any. On the subject of black cowboys, Elvis highlights the 1969 film The Learning Tree, directed by Gordon Parks, based on his own novel. It's a coming-of-age story set in Kansas in the 1920s and contains striking images of black people on horses. Elvis had a chance to interview Gordon Parks. And just remember having that conversation with him about how thrilling it was to see black people on horseback in color, in widescreen. He said, I waited my whole life to do that. We shot that movie in Kansas because the studio wouldn't come. I knew if I made a movie in Paris, they'd all want to come over and get in my way. But I knew if I made a movie in Kansas, nobody would come. And so he said, the thing, I said, because it was, I realized it was a dream I didn't know I had until I saw it. The shot near the beginning of the learning tree where you see black riders on horseback framed, silhouetted by a sunrise. It's a gorgeous shot. He said, yeah, he said, I basically threw everything I could into that movie because I figured I was never going to get a chance to make another one. And so all these things, I mean, that movie took me back to being on my grandmother's farm and those conversations and the kind of relationship that, that black people of a certain generation had with the movies and with movie theaters. Elvis has vivid memories of watching movies in Detroit. When he was in high school, he worked downtown for Lewis the Hatter in the Fox Theater building and learned how to project movies in a basement screening room. There was a time when Detroit's movie theaters ran for 24 hours a day, catering to factory workers who had shifts around the clock. Our conversation veered into reminiscing about Detroit theaters now gone, 
such as the gem and fine arts. Elvis asked about my movie-going memories. The big change for me was when I got my driver's license, I could come down to Detroit to Detroit and Sioux Farts and see that. I've, I've talked to Dream Hampton, who was also going to see those movies. We could, we could probably line up uh, you know, uh, calendars from 1985, 1986, and, and circle the f films that we saw because our, our memories were so strong of, uh, of those years. Oh, sure. My first big thrill as a profession was writing notes for the DFT and getting paid with Calvin Trillin, who's calling the nation in the two figures for it. But it was thrilling because it's like, oh my God, so I get a chance to shape what people are thinking about these movies. It was, a, it was a big deal to me. And those program notes were a big deal to, to walk into the DFT and pick up an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper and uh, you know, sit there waiting for the movie and to uh, uh, you know, read what you or Elliot or anyone else had uh, written about it. That was, uh, you know, this was a pre-internet, that was, that was movie culture. It was, it was. I mean, because, I mean, I got to go to, to movie theaters in downtown Detroit. Like I said, I worked. In fact, I got to meet James Baldwin when I was in college uh, because I programmed a double feature <laughs> of, of Mad Max and Alligator. Sounds amazing. And um, it was like second run, and this little guy walks past, like, and he was tiny with these enormous eyes. I just went, Are you James Baldwin? Yeah, right around the corner from the plaza, as a matter of fact. He goes, well, Yes, young man, I am. Um, listen, I run this theater, and I think you might have a really good time at Mad Max. I wasn't about to tell him to go see Alligator, although he might have liked that too. And he went in, and he was speaking. There was a uh, Detroit uh, Library, a small library branch downtown, not far from, from Hudson, uh, Hudson's uh, the department store. So you should come see me speak tonight. Okay. And so that was another brush of fame I had. But I remember telling him, I was reading The Devil Finds Work. Which is his book on movies. Yeah. And um, I remember having this conversation with Skip Gates. He said, it's not a very good book of criticism. I said, no, it's not a good book of criticism, but it's an extraordinarily heartfelt essay about the way movies shaped him as a person. And I think maybe there's a fine line between what criticism is, but I think as a social document and as part of his ongoing autobiography, it's a really important piece of work. It, uh, it comes up in I Am Not Your Negro, the film that Raoul Peck made uh, about James Baldwin. Some of the writings from uh, The Devil Finds Work are woven into that and you uh, you get a sense or I got a sense uh, that of how much Baldwin wanted to um, have his work crossing over into cinema but that was you know there's a point where he wanted Billy D. Williams to play Malcolm X as is mentioned in the movie and uh, uh, and and I actually had written a script for it yeah it's a great script um, 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 one day when I was lost the Baldwin script um, before Arnold Pearl came on to a rewrite uh, for it. Um, and um, there's a point where I had some ball with stuff in too because, uh, but we just, this movie at one point, I'm not kidding, was three and a half hours long. And it certainly was like, you know, either it's a TV show or it's a movie. And we lost a bunch of stuff. But Baldwin actually wrote some interesting things about Sidney Poitier. And he talked about, well, you know, you could have Brother John you could have Superfly, which was the very next year. And at one point, that was a, the transition from 71 into 72 for the movie, because my film was sort of broken, was originally broken into pieces, 1968 through 71, 72, which I think is the epical year, 72 through 75, 75 to 77, and then 77, 78. So those, it was, and there, if you look, you can sort of see where the transition points were. But... I think I could not have made this movie had I not lived here, just because there was such a schism between the kind of stuff you see in downtown Detroit and the things you see in the suburbs. I mean, even my friends who live in the suburbs said, well, we don't want to get asked for ID'd an R-rated movie. We'd go to downtown Detroit. Because as long as you could produce cash, you could get to the movie theater. Uh, and, <laughs> and also it was an important film city too, because this is the place where 
legitimately Sweetback had its world premiere at the Grand Circus. I remember those radio spots as a kid, a rated X by an all-white jury, which as, if you know Melvin, you know that wasn't true because they never had the money to, eat, to pay for the rating. So he just stuck an X on it, and he changed the world with that. Uh, you, you, you reference in, uh, in the film you know, distinct memories you have, like going with your father to see Cotton Comes to Harlem, uh, which is the movie that gives your film its, its title, because uh, that's a refrain in Cotton Comes to Harlem. Is that black enough uh, for you? Um, I, I appreciate you working in those rich details. When you were, when you were shaping this, um, d was it a question how much of yourself you w were going to put in into it? No, I mean, it was never that because it was always meant to be an essay. I would describe it as an essay just because its original uh, invention was to be a book. And um, the idea actually came from another Detroiter, or at least he helped me sort of to foment this. Uh, I was at Sundance in 99 and I, I met the Hughes brothers. And um, I remember this because um, you, you know that they have that thing in there called the Filmmaker's Lunch, and I was on the jury, so I was saying, do I have to go to this lunch? And he got, no, you don't have to go, which meant I had to go. So it was like an hour and a half bus ride to the Sundance Resort. And of course, it turned out I was the only jury member who was stupid enough to go. <laughs> but um, the Hughes brothers were there with their film American Pimp, and nobody had seen it yet, so everybody thought it was going to be like this comically gleeful look at black culture. And they were there with their pimp, who was the six foot six guy wearing a suit made of Louis Vuitton leather. I'm not kidding. So to see this guy walking around in this party with a bunch of terrified white people, that alone <laughs> wasn't worth the price of admission. And so I was talking to Alan and Albert, the Hughes brothers, and we were talking about dead presidents, and Alan goes, oh yeah, we aimed low and we missed. And I said, well, one of the things I, th I think I really love about it is the, the music you guys use in it because you have Walk On By by Isaac Hayes. And I've always thought that that piece of music was stolen. And Albert says of me in unison from Once Upon a Time in the West. And that's when I thought, oh, so I'm, these are not just random thoughts I have on my own, that other people notice these things too. Detroiters. And, Detroiters, exactly. The, the Hughes brothers. Uh, and so I thought, well, this is... Interesting, I, I gave it some more thought and then was worked on this book idea and was fortunate enough to get to be friendly with Toni Morrison and was at dinner with her. And I've told the story in interviews. I hate to sort of belabor this, but I still can't believe I knew Toni Morrison. And uh, I was telling her I was going to write this book. She said, well, you know, I'll, I can write the introduction. At which point I just kind of went, oh, you mean me? To my book. And she said, yeah. And then she just started talking. And I ran around and started grabbing napkins and cloth napkins, by the way, so I had to pay for them to write things down because I just wanted to make sure these things were committed to, to print somewhere. Just her contribution and her excitement about this kept it going to that point where it was getting turned down by everybody. And I'm sure some people turned it down twice. And then I was at dinner with Steve McQueen and was telling him about it. He goes, that's not a book. I went, yeah, I know it's not a book. Nobody's buying it. He goes, no, it's a documentary, and here's why. And as he said that, I realized what I could do with a documentary is if you're writing a book, you're describing scenes. With a documentary, people's eye can go where it wants to go. And so that became really an interesting exercise when we were putting the movie together of how to choose the clips and trying to uh, choose clips for impact. Uh, you always had strong relationships with filmmakers, even when you were a critic. A lot of times critics choose not to do that. Um, and, and I wonder if that was something that you ever you know, felt as a you know, deliberate choice that, uh, that, that you were gonna forego this invisible wall that's supposed to exist? Well, first of all, I'm a hard person to miss. <laughs> a lot of film critics, you know, they all kind of all look the same. When I walk into a room, I'm really easy to spot. So, and the one thing I've learned from Pauline Kael, who I met here in Detroit, as a matter of fact, was that when people come up and talk to you, you, you owe them a, a response. You can't just like pretend like you're not listening to it. You have to, because she, I would go spend time with her at her house in Great Barrington, and she would show me the mail, and she wrote back to every person who wrote her. And so I was dumb and arrogant enough to believe that, you know, I'll be friendly with you, but I'm, it's not going to change the way I think. 
And there are people who I've become better friends with now that I'm not writing criticism anymore or friends with. I can tell you, meeting Quentin Tarantino, every time I meet him, people just kind of gather because it would be an enormous argument, like a huge argument. There are filmmakers about whom I've said things that they thought were unkind, and they stopped speaking to me. So it wasn't like this was a guarantor that I was going to be friends with people. I just, and that was something I got from Paul Lee, you understand that. If, if you presume that because I'm friendly or civil with you, that I'm not going to say what I think, then you're mistaken. And, and so, again, because for a long time, <laughs> I was the black person at the screening, I was kind of hard to miss. And then the black guy with dreadlocks, which really made me hard to miss. So, I mean, it would have been rude to just sort of say no. But, and what I would say to people, listen, this is what this is going to be. And if it's going to be an issue, because I had one person who I thought was a friend who just said, yeah, he didn't review my movie. It's like, yes. <laughs> I can't do that. And, and they're, 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 I thought the friendships were close. And I said, clearly this is going to come back to bite me so I cannot review your movie. And people who should know better. Uh, you spent four years at the New York Times, uh, maybe a little more than that. Um, when uh, you left, it puts me in mind of a line from Hamilton where King George hears that George Washington has left and says, I didn't realize that was something people could do. Uh, I didn't realize that you know, leaving the New York Times was <laughs> you know, an option on the table uh, once you had uh, entered such a, uh, a nice place in journalism. I just thought... This is hard. <laughs> uh, just because I had a pretty idiosyncratic stylist, I think, so a of writing, and it was this constant sort of series of fights with the ed editing desk. At one point, I was having this conversation with the editor who hired me, and he goes, yeah, you know, that's the thing with the Times, it's not a writer's newspaper. It's like, oh, yeah, that, I learned that the hard way. And there were jokes that I, there were jokes that would just sort of sneak in, <laughs> And I could tell a story about a joke. I'll tell you this, okay, quickly. There's, I don't, and I won't say the joke. Um, I, I could actually tell you a story. One, there's one review where there were kind of a bunch of jokes I was using and, a, and got head cut out. My review of Pinocchio, which because it went in on Christmas Day, I knew the regular editors weren't around. So it was like, I just loaded it for bear. It was, <laughs> it was basically a stand-up piece. Clearly, we all have to go Google the Pinocchio review uh, uh, from the New York Times. So we'll just uh, put that out there. That was great just because I remember going to see it because they didn't screen it beforehand, the Roberto Benigni Pinocchio. And going, I was in uh, Phoenix going to visit my family, my sister there, and going to the multiplex, having to go to the early show at 9 o'clock because of the time difference. And there was a line, it was Christmas Day, the line was wrapped around the multiplex. Like, oh my God, can I even get into this? Do I trying to go play the credit card with the manager of the theater. Then I realized the line was for the, for Return of the King. <laughs> and there were six people waiting to see Pinocchio, all of whom were older than me. So it was like, <laughs> it was like an episode to catch a predator, uh, <laughs> going to see Pinocchio, so. And so when you say that line about line up around theater, it reminds me of another big movie going experience. Mine was at the Northland Theater. What'd you see? Uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, I remember line up. Very meaningful at the, uh, Northland Theater was Purple Rain uh, uh, first day it came out. So I remember my friend John Walter and I were in high school. He's a lot taller than me. We came up to see like the one o'clock Friday afternoon show and there were these two uh, white teenage girls who came running up to us to ask us to buy their tickets. Um, and, they, and I realized later that I, the four of us were about the only white people in the theater, so it's like they had been, you know, kind of waiting for someone they, you know, they were afraid to ask. <laughs> comfortable. <laughs> to buy <laughs> well, see that, see that's important to me because the second place that Prince blew up outside of Minneapolis was here. If you Bigger were, because of uh, the Mojo. Electrify Mojo. Absolutely, thank you. Finally, a white person I can say Mojo to and not have him think it's a British magazine. Yes. We're referring to this 1980s Detroit DJ. WJLB Detroit presents the Midnight Funk Association. Each night at midnight, the world comes to life. I was at the Prince show at the Silverdome where he blew the Rolling Stones off the stage and they fired him from the, 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 the tour. 
is like, oh, the white people got to go, well, that's what it's like to see somebody who can actually dance on stage. And seeing, I probably saw Prince 20 times, at least seven or eight times here. I remember seeing him play um, Joe Lewis in the summer of 2004. And if anybody here remembers this, he came out in sneakers. He said, y'all know me here, my back hurts. I can't do the splits of these dances on those heels. We all take the night off together. That's a rare experience. That... It, was, it was thrilling, but I mean, that's, it's, this is, I feel like the Northland, for that reason, would have been the perfect place to see Purple Rain. What was the crowd response like? Oh, you couldn't hear anything for the first 10 minutes because Prince was talking. No one had ever heard Prince talk before, really. I mean, maybe, you know, if you'd been tuning into his you know, birthday interview with Mojo, you know, maybe. But, but, but even then, when he was doing stuff, because we learned later, he would do these... He's doing this act. He was speaking a falsetto. Well, he wasn't. He wouldn't actually speak in his register. So you're right. That was the first time you got to, for an extended period of time you get to hear him speak in his register. You recently did an interview with Mark Marin uh, talking about this film. You said something there. You listen to that? That's an hour and something. I listen to yours. I don't care. I listen to the others. Uh, uh, but you said that it's uh, it's sometimes hard to love pop culture when it doesn't love you back. Uh, and you have a line in the film that's uh, similar uh, uh, to this. And, you know, your, your film, uh, uh, Is That Black Enough For You, is an explication of all the ways in which uh, these film artists had to fight against uh, a, a bigger Hollywood culture that wasn't letting them in. And, and even when they had huge successes, even as you say, as you point out in the film, they saved Hollywood in the 1970s with uh, th uh, these uh, so-called black exploitation films that were really making money when other things uh, weren't making money in Hollywood. Hollywood still didn't love them back. When you say something like, it's hard to love pop culture when it doesn't love you back, you, I don't know anyone who loves pop culture more than, than you do and who's invested more time and and absorb. So you're saying you're a masochist? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> well, I'm not sure I understand. I'm, try, I'm trying to. I, I, I'm I'm curious. Usually therapy costs a little bit more than this, but okay, let's go. What else? <laughs> what else are you gonna tell me about me? I'm curious. In all these years that you've been in in Hollywood, you know, so close to the belly of this beast that has, as you eloquently put it in the film, like, uh, you know, from the days of. Birth of a Nation uh, on, been an active proponent of, of, of racism in this country. Um, uh, you've got to study it up close, and it can't have always been comfortable. Well, I mean, it's because it's this sort of thing where you can like make a joke about it, and people go, oh, we get that, but you know, nobody else would. There's this kind of thing just because there's such a bubble that exists in, in, in these worlds that um, then so many of these people would consider themselves to be liberal and progressive and right-minded thinkers, and they just can't fight the system. And But the other thing I was trying to, the point I was trying to make in this movie too, is that black creative talent, when it succeeds, it's, it's so often because it's often entrepreneurial. We go back to the lesson of Oscar Michel, who had to find the resources to make a movie, then find the place to make a movie, and then cut the movie, and then do the sound for the movie, and then go out and find a theater to book the movie in, and then go out and do publicity for the movie, then stay at the theater during the week at play to make sure he got his, his money back, because as often as not, they would try to cheat him out of the money, and then go to another town and do that over again. And then that lesson is passed down to Melba Van Peebles, who has to do the same thing. And then that lesson is passed down to Spike Lee, who has to do the same thing, and Robert Townsend, who has to do the same thing to Tyler Perry, who is now the biggest deal in show business by having absorbed that lesson. And in so many of these cases, they're, they, they're, these talents didn't really know. Like Melvin would tell you that he found out about Oscar Me Show after he took Sweet Back out. And Spike wasn't really, he knew sort of about Melvin and, and Michelle, but he didn't understand that. And Robert Townsend really didn't know that part of the history, but he invented this whole new way of selling independent film that, if you remember, became the way. Everybody would make a film. They go, well, I put it on my credit cards. And that came from the marketing of Hollywood Shuffle. And then I remember meeting Tyler Perry in 2005 when his first film was coming out. He said, well, you know, because 
because I'm from Detroit and I have family here, I would go see Tyler Perry plays in the 90s at the Fox when he was taking them around to one man show. I will tell you guys this story that, because if you, who, has anybody here ever seen a live Tyler Perry musical with a black audience? Yeah. It's the most, at the Fox, isn't that incredible? God, I'll tell you one, at one point he was doing a show and somebody's phone rang and he says, Madi, he goes, honey, he went and takes the phone. I give this back to you when the show is over. And I just thought, this is the man who knows his audience, literally. And so, when he's getting his first movie made, it was a Paramount, Diary of a Mad Black Woman, they had brought in a, a white screenwriter who rewrote this thing. And he said, well, this isn't what I wrote. And he goes, yeah, well, you don't really know audiences and this guy. It's like, I guarantee you this guy hasn't been on the road with his show for three years for 200 nights a year like I have. And so he actually bought the rights back and set it up himself with his screenplay and got Michael Schultz to direct it, got a black director we could trust, who, got, uh, who directed a number of films mentioned in mine, including Cooley High and Car Wash. And the thing that Tyler Perry said, the lesson he took, that's the same lesson that he was able to really build on from Oscar screen shows that, I know my audience, I'm just gonna go and sell these movies to my audience, I don't care. And I remember being at the Venice Film Festival and seeing Michael Clayton and thinking, Ugh. Anyway, and, but it was getting these rapturous reviews and I just thought, this movie's gonna get killed by the new Tyler Perry movie. And sure enough, it did. And it took 50, 10 years of Tyler Perry being a success before people kind of recognized, but he wasn't looking for approbation. He was just going to go ahead and make his movies. And he understood that you build your own distribution system and your own studio system. He was able to do things that people had not done before him. And, and, and these guys, by their success, become the lesson that others emulate. Going back to Michelle, going back to, again, Curtis Mayfield, because you think about from Saturday Night Fever on, every movie made for an audience under 30, there's a music video made to sell the movie. That lesson comes from black films and black soundtracks. And Tyler Perry just going, you know, I know what to do with this. I'm never going to trust the studio with my movies again. I'm going to make and own my own product. And now, a scant 20 years into his tenure, he's treated as, as a serious person. Um, and and uh, it's, anyway, you don't wait for something sometimes to love you back. You just go ahead and say, if I can make this, people will come and see it. And it's the lesson I kind of learned in my own career because I got, I was just saying to somebody this morning, I, could, I heard no so much that I thought was my middle name after a while. And when I graduated from school, if you guys remember a film critic here named Susan Stark. Um, so there was an opening for a second string with the news. And so I sent her some of my clips and she had me come in and she took an hour to explain to me in excruciating detail how I had no business doing this. And I didn't know what I was talking about. I just thought, well, first of all, I never liked anything to be did. I actually said that to her. She just thought I was being so regrets. But that's the point where I met Pauline Kale, who was encouraging me to do this. So I called Pauline. She goes, who the F is that? I mean, I've never even heard of this person before. She clearly doesn't know what she's talking about. But it's just so often. And you asked me about being that person in the room. for. Most of my career, I was the only black person in the room. And, 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 and as often as not, I just sort of said, well, I just need to keep my own counsel, but also remind myself there's a community that I'm representing that is not just me. And, and one of the reasons I've kept doing this is I've always thought I want to sort of provide that. I mean, just be that person somebody can see and go, oh, well, if he can do it, I know I can do it. Thank Elvis Mitchell for speaking with me. His new film, Is That Black Enough For You?, is now on Netflix. His show, The Treatment, is available wherever you get your podcasts. See our show notes for a link to his 2002 review of Pinocchio. Thanks to the Free Film Festival for hosting this conversation and to Robin Chan of the Detroit Free Press for his help. Pure Nonfiction 
recently debuted an email newsletter called Producers Notebook. It's a space for documentary producers to discuss the latest developments in the field. You can sign up to receive the newsletter for free at purenonfiction.net. Thanks to our team, series producer Hannah Nordenswan, marketing manager Bella Racklin, our intern Sahai John, and web designer Cross Strategy. Our theme music is composed by Andre Williams, and our executive producer is Raphael Nehausen. I'm Tom Powers. Follow us on Instagram at Pure Nonfiction. <laughs>